For our final show before our big relocation break, we look prophetically at the day when the devil will resurrect another old trick, one that misled nearly the entire Jewish nation of old and will mislead nearly the entire Christian church in the days to come. This one might hurt a bit, friends, not because it's a complicated truth, but because it's one that many of us don't actually want to hear. But take heart, because the goal is to know the real Jesus Christ and to love his soon appearing. Any difficult choices that we must make in the meantime are all worth it when we meet Jesus Christ face to face. Thanks for watching our shortened season two in this temporary studio here. Welcome to the last show in this space. All right, friends, I warned you in the opener, it might be a tough one today. So thank you for being brave and loving the Lord enough to, to get through this anyway. I pray it will be an edifying show, even if you find it to be difficult. The article for today is actually a reversion, a repeat of Monday's uh, article, Why Was the Messiah Expected to Free Israel from Rome? We read a little bit from this on Monday uh, to kind of gain the context of what it means to be a false messiah, what they were looking for instead of the actual messiah. But <clears throat> down here in the key elements of prophecy section, we read some, you know, some good guidance for what we need to talk about today. Um, when Jesus arrived, God's purpose was not to save his nation so they could disobey him again and fall into slavery once more. He wanted them to be saved for all time from their biggest enemy, sin. Benjamin, and I don't know that last name there, uh, Rybeck? No, Rysek? Bisek? I don't know. This guy, Benjamin, wrote, The whole of scripture teaches that the greatest enemy to God's people is internal. And we deeply resist this teaching. There were clues all throughout scripture, okay? We collectively deeply resist the teaching that the greatest enemy is in our own heart. That's what he's saying here. And so it goes on to say Isaiah 53 also undermines a militaristic, militaristic expectation. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. With his wounds, we are healed. Okay, it goes on. You can read it on your own. My point is that um, they had the correct prophecies. They simply misunderstood them because of the circumstances that were around them. So I am going to suggest to you that we collectively in the 21st century today are going to fall into the exact same trap as they did 2,000 years ago. The exact same one. The details might be different, obviously, because it's 2,000 years later, but the trap itself is the same. And a, a scripture to kind of launch us into that idea is going to be in the book of Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes chapter 1. We find in verse 9 and 10... This idea <clears throat> says, that which has been is what will be, and that which is done is what will be done. And there is nothing new under the sun. Is there anything of which it, it may be said, see, this is new. It has already been in ancient times before us. In other words, the Bible says history repeats itself endlessly. Whatever's happening now, as novel and new as it may sound and seem, is simply a repetition of something that has already occurred. And so I'm not trying to give you strange doctrine today. The Bible already says the mistakes of the, of the past will be repeated in the future and the present. So of course, if God's people have fallen into a major trap once, it is almost guaranteed that we will fall into that major trap again, at least on this side of heaven before God makes everything new. Why did the ancient Jews have a wrong understanding of what they were looking for? Well, it's because Jesus Christ showed up with a message they were not expecting. Here's an example. In the Gospel of Luke, chapter 17, 
In Luke 17, Jesus, I'm looking at verse 21, Jesus says, this is the latter part of verse 21, the kingdom of God is within you. It's in your heart. It's inside of you. So yes, there's a, there's a physical kingdom coming, but the kingdom is available to you right now in your heart. If you submit to God, allow him to change your heart. Well, the Jews were not interested in this. They were being oppressed by the Romans on every side. And so they were thinking much more like Isaiah 11, verses 1 through 4. Um, Isaiah 11, verse 1, says that a rod, and that's a messianic term that stretches all the way back to the book of Genesis, but a rod will come from the stem of Jesse, which is... David's ancestors. So they're looking to the family lineage of King David for someone who's going to bear that rod and come and release them. And down in verse 4 of the same chapter, we're told that that rod from the stem of Jesse will also strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips, he shall slay the wicked. Now, you and I understand that this is a prophecy of the second coming of Jesus Christ when he returns to put sin and shame, uh, sin and death to shame. But the Jews were looking for this in their own day. They wanted someone to release them from the oppression of the Romans, not to release them from the oppression of sin, right? So you see the problem? They're actually just misapplying prophecies in a way that they want rather than in a way that God wants. So here's another example, okay? In Matthew chapter 8, the gospel of Matthew, Jesus says in verse 20, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. That is, uh, Jesus used that phrase for himself, son of man, um, repeatedly. And he is saying that to do two things. On the one hand, he is, he's putting himself underneath the needs of mankind. I'm, I'm not, I'm the son of man, right? Mankind is up here. I am in service to mankind, right? So I'm the son of man. But he's also using that phrase in its Old Testament context. And so he's, he's there to say, I am here to serve you. But the Jewish nation hears it in the context of Daniel chapter 7. So when we go to the Old Testament, Daniel 7 verses 13 and 14, we find that same phrase. Scripture says, I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom, that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom the one which shall not be destroyed. All right, so Jesus shows up saying, hey, I'm, submissive. I'm a submissive servant. But what they heard was, I'm the one who's going to overthrow your oppressive uh, captors and set you above them. They missed the message in front of them because they were only interested in the message that they wanted to hear. We're going to do this same thing. We're going to fall into the same trap. And let me show you how. I, I mean, I think we'll do this in a number of ways, but... The, the way I believe is the most obvious illustration is this, Daniel 11. Now, we've talked about Daniel 11 many times on this show. We even have some extended content in the uh, paid subscriber uh, behind the paywall there on Locals. So that's, let, let that be an enticement for you to become a paid subscriber and go learn all about Daniel 11. But... For uh, the end of this show, you'll have to just believe me and then go check out the former episodes if you need more information. That the kings of the south and the north represent spiritual positions. And so when we see these characters um, in conflict with one another throughout Daniel 11, we understand, yes, they refer to individual people and systems and whatnot, but 
it's not just that individual person or system because the spirit of that person or system will outlive the person or system itself, right? And so it will just continue on in a different form in the future. Well, when we kind of do our homework and we study out verse 40 and the, we go to chapter 12, verses 6 and 7, and we throw in some historical knowledge from the French Revolution, we arrive at the conclusion that the king of the South represents secular ideas, the spirit of secularism, or in other words, the spirit of the absence of God. And so various ways this has manifested is in socialism, communism, humanism, materialism, all these isms, right, that we create when we take God out of the picture. The king of the north is kind of the extreme opposite of that. It's not the truth as it is in Jesus in the scripture, it's the truth as it is in the demonic systems that bear Jesus's name, right? So like that little horn that we talked about yesterday would be the king of the north. It is clearly not of Jesus, but it's rampaging around and putting people to death and persecuting this and persecuting this all in the name of Jesus. It's religionism. And so when the king of the north and the king of the south are in this perpetual conflict, Jesus gets lost because Jesus doesn't belong to either one of these kings, even the one that bears his name. Well, in verse 40 here, we see <clears throat> that at the time of the end, the king of the south shall attack him. That's the king of the north. And the king of the north shall come against him, the king of the south, like a whirlwind with chariots, horsemen, and many ships, and blah, blah, blah from there. That means the conflict at the end of time will take the form of secularism on a rampage until it is checked and ultimately destroyed by religionism on an even bigger rampage. So look around you. Is secularism not on a rampage? When we have baseball teams welcoming drag strip shows using Christian imagery as like stripper poles and whatnot, when we have public schools hiding gender ideology from parents of confused children, when nothing means nothing because we've redefined everything, we've redefined what marriage means, we've redefined what salvation means, we've redefined all the terms of God uh, that we can. This is crazy. And it's, in my humble opinion here, destroying Western society because Marxism is under that banner of the King of the South and Marxism just atomizes and destroys everything. So what is a believer to do? I want it to stop, right? I want a different set of leadership that values God and has nothing to do with this kind of secular craziness. What will you do? The next time, let's just, let's say a Republican, or it could be anybody, right? Next time, not the party that champions all these secular things gets into power and begins to say, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. You're probably going to be happy, right? Oh, thank goodness somebody came to save me from these Democrats or save me from these socialists or save me from these gender-confused ideologies. Oh, thank you, Lord, for sending this savior. But what happens if that savior is actually the king of the north? And all you've really done was championed a different oppressive force. Now he's going to step on you in the name of Jesus instead of in the name of gender ideology or whatever. You've just done the same thing the Jews did. You paid attention to what you wanted to hear. Not what God actually said. This is my greatest fear. So the, the devil knows this and he's going to use this against us. And the more that we hate whatever we read on CNN or in the New York Times, right? The more that we hate watching our society that we grew up in just erode and decay, the more we are going to be inclined to love whatever changes that paradigm. But God is very clear. The thing that's going to change this paradigm is just as much from the devil 
as the paradigm that we're in itself. Let us not look at these prophecies that point us to Jesus and decide that we want to worship the devil in the name of Jesus instead. Are you hearing what I'm trying to say? Because I find it to be very, like, sobering and alarming that we're so close to the return of Jesus and most of God's people are looking somewhere else. That's not what I want for you, friends. And that's not what I want for me. Let's pray right now because Jesus is the only answer to any of this. Father, we need you to come and straighten us out. We need you to fulfill your command to come out of Babylon, to, to remove the mystery and confusion from our hearts and our minds so that we don't have this attractive falsehood in front of us. Let us only see you and let us understand the beauty of your cross and what it represents. Father, protect us from all of the deceptions of the devil. Seal us and keep us. And call our names on that great resurrection day so we can enter into eternity with you as one human family. Please forgive our sins as you have promised. In the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. And with that... Season two comes to an end. I will be praying for you until we meet again at the beginning of season three. And I pray again that you will, you know, become a paid supporter of Locals. You can be part of this journey with us in more or less real time. But whether you do that or not, I pray that you will know and love the Lord Jesus Christ and hide your weaknesses in him. Because the days that are coming are dangerous and scary. And he's the only safety that will get us through it. So may God bless you. And even though it will be a while before we publish new content, we will still publish some repeat content in the meantime. So you definitely still need to be subscribed. Here, let's go through it one more time, friends. On Facebook, like our page and change your notifications to be alerted for videos. On YouTube, find the Talking Donkey International channel and subscribe to it and also hit your notification bell. On TalkingDonkeyInternational.org slash podcast, you can just bookmark that page and come get all of, all of our archives in one place. On uh, Rumble, you can find our Something's Happening Here channel and hit the follow button. And on Locals, somethingshappeninghere.locals.com that's a free community, but the real good stuff is behind the paywall. So if you become a paid supporter, you'll get all of our exclusive content and all of the move documentation that I hope to be able to provide for you coming up. Thank you so much for your faith in this ministry. Thank you for, for hanging out with us through seasons one and two. And by God's grace, you will still be here in our permanent studio for season three and beyond. May God bless you. May God reveal himself to you. And I hope that we can meet one day when we meet Jesus face to face. God bless. I'm Steve Hicks.